So 1 Samuel chapter 18 tonight, and I'm going to kind of talk about a topic I discussed a little bit last week, and that's the subject of loyalty. I know I spent some time on loyalty, but what's great about this chapter is you see uh, not just the importance of loyalty like we did last week, but you actually see how loyalty plays out. You see loyalty in action, loyalty in action. It says there in Saul, in verse 1, And Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. So Jonathan, right out of the gate here, is proving his loyalty to David. If you recall last week in the beginning of the chapter that, uh, that Jonathan had uh, delighted greatly in David to the point where he's taking off his robe, he's taking off his girdle, he's giving him his sword, he's giving him his garments, and he's basically pledging you know, his allegiance to David rather than his son. And he's basically showing everybody that he accepts the fact that David is going to be king one day and that himself, Jonathan, is not going to be king one day. <clears throat> so he's proving, he's showing his loyalty last week. He's professing that loyalty. But what's great about this chapter this week is that we actually see that loyalty in action. Jonathan goes and actually proves his loyalty. And you notice there, I mean, David, or Saul speaking to Jonathan and his, serv and his servants that they should kill David. And if you're paying attention as you're reading the scripture, you know, the servants were okay with that. They followed through. I mean, they, in the previous chapter, it says they, that David was accepted of Saul's servants, and he was accepted of all the people. But that just means that they, you know, they said, okay, you're legitimate. We accept you as, you know, a captain of the host. It doesn't mean that they were, you know, delighting in him or that they were loyal to him. And what you see here is that, you know, this really proves the, the, the loyalty of Jonathan because they could have followed through with this, and Jonathan already had the king on his side, and Jonathan had all the king's servants on his side. And he could have gone ahead and, and said, yeah, let's kill him, let's take him out, let's keep that throne in the family. But he didn't, because he loved Jonathan, because of what Jonathan stood for, we talked about that last week, but because he was loyal, and he was actually going to put that loyalty in action this week, in this chapter. So it says there, Jonathan, Saul's son, in verse 2, delighted much in David, and Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my, seek, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take the heed uh, to thyself until the morning and abide in a secret place and hide thyself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where, thou art, where thou, out, thou art, and I will commune with my father of thee, and I will see. And what I see, that will I tell you. It's like I'm going to be honest with you. Whatever he says, that's what I'm going to tell you. <clears throat> the events of chapter 17 weren't just for show. All that, you know, song and dance about him taking off the robe, that wasn't just him trying to say, hey, look how loyal I am or... You know, what, what a great guy I am. And Jonathan's a great guy. The more I read about Jonathan, the more I understand more about Jonathan, the more I love the guy. Now I understand more and more why people name their son Jonathan. He's really one of the great characters in the Bible. Unfortunately, his life ended short, and, and, and we'll talk about that when we get there. But Jonathan's a great guy. I mean, he's, he's loyal to David, and it's not, just, it's not just lip service. And you see a lot of that today, don't we? People saying, oh, I'm loyal to this person. And then as soon as there's an actual trial, as soon as there's actually tribulation, as soon as there's an attack, as soon as there's a real threat, it's like, oh, yeah, well, I was never associated with that guy. I didn't really want anything to do with him anyway. And people turn on each other all the time. And that's something that's going to take place more and more in these last days, that men shall be lovers of themselves. What else do they should be? They shall be covenant breakers. They should be disloyal, right? So loyalty, is a, it's not something we want to underestimate. It's a very important uh, value. It's a very important characteristic that really should be part of who we are. You know, we should look at Jonathan here and take note of it. You know, Jonathan's being loyal even to the point where he's kind of to, to his own detriment. I mean, he, obviously, you know, he couldn't see everything that was going how everything was going to play out. But you know, he 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 knew very well that by being loyal to David, he's basically giving up the throne. You know, and that was you know to his detriment, so to speak. Obviously, if he hadn't, his life hadn't ended the way it did, he could have gone on and lived a godly life and, and still been blessed of the Lord and all that. <clears throat> but here's the thing about loyalty. You know, people can say they're loyal all day until it's actually proven. You know, loyalty has to be tested in order to be proven. You, can you can't just tell people, I'm loyal, I'm loyal, I'm loyal, and then never have it tested. We know when a person's loyal when we see them, that loyalty actually be tested. And Jonathan, you know, he, he's, he's offered David's life. That's what he's offered here. He's saying, Dad's saying, hey, Saul's coming to him and saying, let's, let's take him out. Let's kill him. The servants are like, yes, sir, we'll do it. 
but it was his loyalty that came through for David. Loyalty takes action. The Bible says, if you would, go over to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Loyalty is something that has to be tested to be proven. Because loyalty is, is something you have to put into action in your life. Luke chapter 6 says this. In verse 45, Jesus said, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, uh, the mouth speaketh. You say, what has that got to do any, with anything? But we're talking about tonight. Well, it says here that the that the good treasure, uh, the good uh, a man, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringing forth that which is good. You know, David or, or or Jonathan being loyal to David, having that loyalty tested and remaining faithful. You know, that's that proves that he's a good man because that's coming out of his heart, right? And it says in verse forty six, Jesus in the context of that scripture talking about how. Good things come out of a good man's heart, and evil things come out of an evil man's heart. For out of the abundance of the, mouth, out of abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. He says, verse 46, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So, in a way, it's kind of in the context of loyalty, isn't it? He's saying, look, good people are going to bring forth good things, bad people are going to bring forth bad things. And then he says this, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? It's one thing to say, I'm loyal to God, I'm faithful to the Lord, I'm going to live for Him all my days. Well, you know, people can say things. But if what's coming out of your mouth is real and sincere and good, then you'll do the things which He says. You'll remain loyal. You know, and I was thinking about this today as I was writing the sermon, just how many people I've just seen and come and go over the years. And I'm not saying that to try and lift myself up like, oh, I've been around so long. There's people that have been serving God longer than I've been alive. I understand that. But I do, I've been around a little while, and one thing I've noticed is just people come and go. People come and go. It's a revolving door. I mean, some people, you're glad that they went. <laughs> some, people, it's, it's some people, you have to help them out the door because they need to go. Okay? And I'm not saying everybody that leaves is bad. Sometimes people leave for good reasons. And I understand, we understand that. But a lot of people leave just because they're not loyal. They're not, they're not, not necessarily, in, or here's the other problem, they're loyal only to a man. They're loyal only to a church. They're not loyal to the Lord. Because if, if you're loyal to God, you're going to put up, and I know I talked about this last week, you're going to put up with faults in a church. You're going to put up with faults in a man of God. You'll put up with that stuff because you'll understand a church, no church is perfect, no man is perfect. And our loyalty shouldn't lie in a man or in a church. It should lie in the Lord at the end of the day. He said, and here's the thing about loyalty is that it takes action. We could say, I'm loyal. I'm, oh, I'm going to be there. I'm going to serve God the rest of my life. Well, we, it's going to take the rest of your life to find out whether or not that's true. But he says in, uh, in James chapter 2, in, you're, you're in James 2, I'll read from James 4, it says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And here's what I want to, the point I want to make about loyalty, and we're going to talk about a few other things tonight before we get done. And I'm going to just wrap this up about loyalty, but is that loyalty takes action. Lo loyalty is something that you have to put into practice. In, in uh, 1 Samuel, where you were in chapter 18, it says, And Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, let not the king sin against his servant. So he's pleading David's case, right? He says, hey, he saw the Philistine. You saw it. You rejoiced. He's saying, don't sin against your servant. Don't do this, Dad. He's stopping him out of his loyalty. That's loyalty in action. You know, some people, you know, loyalty is not this passive thing where you say, oh, I'm loyal to this person or whatever. You know, I'm loyal here in the situation. But I'm just going to sit back and see how it plays out. And hopefully it turns out the way, I, you know, hopefully it turns out for the best for the person I'm claiming allegiance to or the person I'm claiming and saying I'm loyal to. It takes action. You know, it gets on the person's side, right? And Jonathan got on David's side and actually went to his father and said, don't do what you're thinking about doing. It's wrong. And stopped it. It wasn't just lip service with Jonathan. It was real. That's why it says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. Say, so, oh, I know I should be loyal. 
Uh, you know, we, we could apply this, you know, perhaps in marriage. That's a great place to apply it. In marriage. People get up, they take a vow, they pledge their loyalty one to another. And then times get tough, tribulation comes, as they do in all marriages, right? Things get tough. Maybe somebody does, hurts another person, whatever. And all, th all of a sudden, loyalty goes out the window. It's like, well, what about all those vows you made? What about those vows you stood there before God and everybody and you made these vows and now they're just gone? Now it's like they don't count. You know, loyalty takes action. It says, you know, even when times are tough, you know, maybe even when one spouse has hurt another, we're gonna, I'm going to stay loyal and I'm going to do something to, to repair this relationship. But it, what I'm getting at is that loyalty isn't just this passive thing where we just sit back and just hope for the best. Hope that it turns out right. They, loyal people get involved. They stand up for the person that they're loyal to, whether in a marriage or in a friendship or in a church. They, get their, they, they, they take action. Look at James chapter 2, verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, Depart in peace, and be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, give not those things which are needful to the body, what doth the profit? You know, I'm using this to make the point that, you know, if a brother or sister like David is, has a death, you know, threat from a very powerful man, if, you know, if somebody's being threatened, if somebody's under attack, and you just say, well, hopefully, hey, hey I'm praying for you. I hope everything turns out okay. Hope you make it. Is that loyalty? No, it's sin. You know, the loyal guy is going to, you know, in this instance, you know, and I'm making application here, obviously, he's saying, you know, you actually, what he's getting at is like, give them the things that are needful. You know, it's great that you're blessing them and saying, hey, you know, depart in peace, but that doesn't count for anything if you don't actually do what's needed. And I could say, oh, I'm loyal, I'm loyal, I'm loyal, but if I don't actually put that loyalty into action, it means nothing. I mean, you know, think about how this could have played out. Jonathan takes off, you know, his, his girdle, his robe. He's given all these, you know, all these things to, to David to show that David's the next in line, that he's going to be king. He's making a big show of his loyalty. And then he just sits back and dad ends up killing him. And it's like, well, I guess I can just take those back now. Put my sword back on. I kind of missed this robe anyway. It's not just passively sitting by loyalty is put into action. It's something that we have to do. You know, what good would Jonathan's loyalty have been if he didn't take action to protect David? It wouldn't have done David any good. You know, and, and people need to learn to be loyal today. This is something that I think it, it lacks. And not, not all the time. I, they're, they're very loyal people. I understand that. But, you know, it's something that's kind of going by the wayside. And it's something that we all ought to have. We ought to determine to be loyal to the people we ought to be loyal to. How about the, the willingness to be associated with somebody who's despised by others? How about the willingness to be associated with your pastor, Pastor Anderson? Because last I checked, that guy's despised <laughs> by some people. Look, when your pastor's getting banned from 30-plus countries, <laughs> there's parts of the world where he's not even welcome. Or he has to touch down. You know, if he touches down, they're just going to say, go back. Get back on the plane. Leave. You're not welcome here. You know, that's somebody that's despised. You know, somebody that's going to make, make national headlines. You know, are you going to be, a, are you ashamed to be associated with that person? Go over to Hebrews chapter 10. Look, the loyal person's not going not to mind. They're going to say, yeah, that's my pastor. What about it? You know, and, and, the, and the, unfortunately, the problem is, is that so many people have a misunderstanding of Pastor Anderson. I mean, some people just hate him because he's speaking the words of truth. Yeah. They just can't stand the fact that somebody's actually preaching the word. They don't hate him. They really hate the Lord. Right. He's just tangible. You know, they can get to him. They can't get to God. But then you'll have other people, you know, who've, who've heard about, you know, they know about him. You know, and this is coming to mind while I'm preaching this because we were out soul winning last night. And he ran into this pastor of a church down there. And this guy had, you know, associations with James White. And if you know James White, he's, he's no Pastor Anderson fan either, right? <laughs> and Pastor Anderson's no fan of James White, right? right. And he goes, the Pastor Anderson goes to the door, and it's kind of his story, maybe he should tell it, but it's a good illustration that I'm trying to make here. 
He knocks on his door and he go and the guy goes, Oh, you're Pastor Anderson. You're at the wrong house, buddy. But by the end of it, the guy's asking for a picture with him. He's like, Hey, can we take a selfie together? It's because people have this image of who he is. And then when they actually meet him, they're like, Oh, he's not just this so you're telling me he doesn't just wake up in the morning and brood about fags all day? <laughs> that he's not just going to find out that I'm associated with James White and just tear my head off? It's like, no, you know, he's got, that's not, that's not who he is. He's, there's a lot of other things to it. But, I'm, but the point I'm trying to say is this, is that some people, you know, they would say, that's your pastor? And we go, well, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's him. You know, that's not loyalty. And if that's how you feel, when the, when the real test comes, when, the, real, when the, the fire really gets hot, when the devil really turns up the heat, you'll be gone. You'll be the next one to go. You'll be the next one that we have to flip through that yearbook and go, oh yeah, I remember them. Whatever happened to that guy? Whatever happened to her? <clears throat> Look, loyalty is not a shame to be associated with somebody that the world despises. I mean, look at how loyal the world is to some of the things that we hold in contempt. I mean, some people are loyal to just the most wicked people, and they're, and they're just out and proud about it. They'll shove it right in your face. You know, we as God's people should not be ashamed of the man of God, ever. Whether it's Pastor Anderson or any, but any other man of God. <laughs> Look at uh, here in t Hebrews 10. I'll read from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. The Bible says, Paul writing, The Lord give mercy in the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. You know, he, Paul's praising this guy. He's saying, you know, Lord, give him mercy. When I was in jail, he wasn't ashamed of my chain. He wasn't afraid to be associated with me. You know, I was, we're not associated, we should be associated with uh, be afraid to be associated with Pastor Anderson just because, you know, he's got, a, he's got a kind of chain on him, right? You know, maybe he can't get into certain countries. Maybe he's bound to certain areas. We should not be ashamed of people who, have, who, the, who the civil authorities have deemed as bad. Say, well, you know, what kind of a pastor goes to jail? Well, I don't know. John the Baptist went to jail. Paul went to jail. Peter went to jail. You know, none of them, you know, and all of them for, you know, not because they were bad, doing bad things. You know, sometimes you go to jail because you broke the law, <laughs> a bad, a wicked law that shouldn't even exist. But you know what? Sometimes you go to jail for righteousness sake. You suffer for righteousness sake. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. It says, but call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endure a great flight of afflictions, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became became companions of, those, of them that were so used. Look, we should be willing to be companions of people that are despised of the world. People that have been, what, made a gazing stock by reproaches and afflictions. Some people are going to go, well, I don't want to go to that church. You know, I might end up having to walk through a picket line. You know, my face might end up in the background, you know, in the background on the 11 o'clock news. The people at work might find out where I go to church. They might Google me, you know. I'm not going to fill in the pulpit and guest preach. I might want to get a job somewhere someday. And if they Google me, you know, that YouTube algorithm Faithful Word has got, or had, I should say, you know, I might, you know, if you Googled Corbin Russell, it's all, <laughs> you find out real quick where I, where I work. And what are we? You know, we're a gazing stock by reproaches and afflictions to the world. I mean, not to the anywhere near the extent that the he, these people that, that Paul's writing to had to go through. I mean, they suffered, a, endured a great fight of afflictions. But they, today, people don't want to be associated with people out of fear of just having some distant relative go, you know, say something bad because where they go to church. It's weak. It's pathetic. But you're going to stand for Christ when, when the Antichrist shows up, right? You're going to, you know, if, you, if you're going to faint when the footmen, you know, how are you going to stand against, you know, the horsemen? You know, how are you going to withstand you know, the, the, in the swelling of Jordan if, if you can't stand in the days of peace? You know, and loyalty is something 
that we need to have because, and here's why, not just, here, here's why, because loyalty can change the outcome for people. I mean, think about how it changed the outcome in David's life. Now, ultimately, we know God would have worked all things together for good and that God was going to protect David no matter what. But the story could have played out a lot differently, couldn't have. Are you back there in 1 Samuel uh, 19? I keep saying 19. Is it 19? I keep getting confused. 19, yeah. I keep wanting to see 18, and I know it's not right. It says in verse 6, And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan. It worked. What if he had just stepped back and said, Well, you know, I'm loyal to David. That's my dad, and I'm just not going to say anything. We'll just, see how, we'll just see how this works out. Could have turned out real bad. I mean, we know God was going to protect David no matter what, but the story would have turned out different, and Jonathan would not come out looking so good. And it says, And Saul swears the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan was showed him all those things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul. I mean, that's how, that's how much of a change his loyalty had in this situation. I mean, Saul's breathing out threatenings and slaughter. Kill David. Let's take him out. And now, out of, because Jonathan was, had some loyalty, he's bringing them back together. He's, he's restored the peace. Why? Because he was loyal. And not just because he was loyal, but because he put that loyalty into action when it counted, when it mattered, when it was tested, when he was proven. He came out looking good. <clears throat> and it says, And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. So that's the importance of loyalty. I mean, loyalty can have a, can, our loyalty can have a major influence on, on a situation. You know, and, I, and he, here's just a small example of that. Being loyal to church. You know, being loyal to church. You know, it's obviously at the end of the day, it's for your sake to be loyal to church. It's, it's, for your, it's, it's for your own edification to come and hear the preaching of the Word of God. Okay, but I will say this. When a person is loyal to church, it's very encouraging to the preacher. It's encouraging when you start to see the same faces showing up on a regular basis. And it's discouraging, you know, and, and you try not to take it personally, and you understand that this is just the way the ministry works, and people are people, people come and go, like I said, but when somebody starts out loyal, 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 and they're there, now they're a little less loyal, and then they're just not around anymore. It's discouraging. I say, what happened? So that's a, that's a small example. I mean, what if everybody in the room tonight just decided, well, I'm just not going to be faithful anymore. You know, I'm just going to, I'm going to be like the manner of some and just forsake the assembling of ourselves together and just quit coming to church altogether. And then I show up Sunday, no one's here. You think I get up here and just, oh, great. Let's have another song. I'm glad I wrote these sermons, even though there's no one to preach to. Right? It's, it, you see how loyal, and I'm just using it as an example. I'm not afraid of that happening. I'm just saying, but you see how your loyalty can have an influence on other people? Right. Think about how your loyalty can have an influence on your family. Your loyalty can have an influence at work. You know, all the other coworkers are talking trash on the boss, cutting corners, stealing, whatever, and you say, I'm, no, I'm loyal to the boss. Next thing you know, you're the one getting the promotion. You're the one that's, you know, when times get tough and the company suffers, you're not the one that gets let go. The loyal person who's faithful and honest, they're the one that gets to stick around. So that's the importance of loyalty, is that, it, you know, it, it can have a serious influence in a situation. It can change the outcome of a situation. It can change people's lives, but it's only going to work if you put it into action when it counts. And not just say you're loyal or think you're loyal, but actually remember, when it's time to be loyal, it's time to be loyal. So that's it on loyalty. But I also, the other thing I want to point out in this, this passage tonight, and I'll do quickly, is, is Saul's conflicted nature. And this is where you really start to see it. I mean, you already know Saul's kind of going down, you know, the, the, the downward spiral of just, you know, he's willing to kill Samuel and he's breathing, he's willing to kill David. And he's, he's already thrown a javelin, right, at David. 
The, guy, the guy's messed up. We know that. Their evil spirit of the Lord is upon him. But there's still part of him, you can see it, and you will see it more in later chapters, that wants to do the right thing. Right. That still part of him knows he's convicted because he's a saved man. I believe he's a saved man. We know that's true. So he's conf- he has this conflicted nature in him. Right? Look at verse 6. And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan, and he sware that he shall not die. How long did that oath last? Didn't even make it through the chapter. He's already thrown another javelin in the next few lines, trying to kill David. You think he was just, but I, I honestly believe, I don't think it was, he was conspiring here. I'm just going to tell Jonathan that he's going to be okay, and then as soon as I get David close, then I'm going to take him out. No, I think when, this is my opinion, but when, when Saul breathed those words, he shall not be slain, I believe he meant it. I believe in his heart, in his mind, he was convinced, you know what, I'm not going to kill David. But he has this evil spirit, and he's conflicted. He has this conflicted nature. And what I find interesting about that, and if you would, go over to Colossians chapter 3. Obviously, to not to this degree where we're, we're, we're contemplating murder or not, but we're kind of in a similar situation, aren't we, as Saul, in a way. I'm going to make application here. But we're kind of in a similar position, too, today as Christians who have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You know, Saul has these two natures kind of pulling apart, these two motives. And we're kind of the same way. What? We have the old man and we have the new man. And they're contrary one to another, right? The Bible says in Romans 7, I find that a law that when I do good, evil is present with me. He says, I'm doing good, but evil's always there. Was it good that Saul made peace with David? Of course. He decided not to kill him. That was a good thing that he did there. Never should have gotten to that point, we understand. But he's saying, look, it's a good thing, but what was there? Evil was still present with him, that evil spirit. And we're kind of we're kind of like a mini Saul in a way. We go through this. He says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I want to do the right thing, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. So his members, you know, his flesh, his body. And that's how we are. And if you don't think you're in that position, then, then you're, you're gravely mistaken. And anyone who's, who, anyone who's striving to live for the Lord understands the, the reality of this. People who are trying to get sin out of their lives and live for God, this is a very real struggle. Okay? The law, another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. Right? And bringing me into captivity the law of sin. O wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from this body of death. So you can see the struggle even in Paul's life. Where he's talking about, look, in my mind, I want to serve God. I want to do the right thing. My motives are pure. My motives are right. But I still got this flesh. I still have this old body, these members that are warring against me. And it just, you know, when I read the story about Saul, I just can't help but think about that. The fact that, you know, he, he's on one hand, he wants to kill, John, kill David. But on the other hand, part of him still wants to do the right thing. He wants to do good. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. He says, But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice. I mean, weren't we just reading about somebody who's suffering from these things? I mean, that's Saul in a a nutshell right there. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, I swear unto the Lord, you shall not die. And he breaks that. Filthy communication out out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing it have put off the old man with his deeds. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Go over to Ephesians chapter 4. So he's saying here in Colossians 3, you know, put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication. Put these things off, right? And then he's saying, and put on, having put on the new man. So it's this deliberate action of putting on the new man. And, And how do you know if you've put on the new man? There's a change in behavior. The part, of, you know, the part of you that's warring against you, you deny that. Like Paul said, I die daily. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So you're putting off the old man by resisting him. right? That, that's why it's called warring against him. My members are warring. right? There's a conflict. And you don't always win, but you should strive to win. Right? And how do you do that? By putting on the new man, and you know that you're, you're doing that, that you're succeeding when your behavior changes. When you stop having the anger, the wrath, the malice, the blasphemy, 
the filthy communication, when you stop lying one to another, all these things, when you're getting along with people, when you're doing the right things, that's when you're putting on the new man. It results in a change of behavior. It's not just a feeling, right? It's something that you actually have to put it again into practice. Now notice the similarities here in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 20. It says, But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that you have heard of him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. So here's this concept again of putting off the old man, right? Which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. It's the flesh. It's corrupted. You can't, you can't change it. You can't convert it. You have to just put it off. You have to just get rid of it. You have to dispose of it. And we know that one day, you know, the hope the ha that we have in Christ Jesus, that blessed hope, that one day we shall see him as he is. And when we see him, we shall be as he is, rather. That one day we're going to be raised incorruptible. And then we're going to have a new body. And this war is going to end. But until then, every day is a battle. Right? He that hath this hope in him keepeth himself pure, the Bible says. You know, so there's, there's a struggle till we get there. We're, we strive to do this. To put off the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So again, it's talking about the war between the, the flesh and the mind. And you put on the new man, which is after God created in Christ Jesus. Now notice the change in behavior. It's the same concept, right? He's laying this all out again. Look, it's, in, it's a war between your mind and your members, the old man and the new man. You've got to put the old man off, put on the new man. And what results? A change in behavior. Look at verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, spake truth every man to his neighbor. Be angry, verse 26, and sin, and sin not. Look at verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, it's the same thing. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So we're kind of like Saul, aren't we? We have these two natures. We're conflicted. Unfortunately for Saul, he also had an evil spirit from the Lord. God was, you know, vexing him. But is God vexing us today? You know, we, we, we definitely, we definitely uh, bag on Saul quite a bit, don't we? People kind of, and, you know, and he kind of deserves it. I mean, he, is what, he did what he did. But do you have an evil spirit from the Lord vexing you today? Or do you, are you sealed with the Holy Spirit? Or do you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? I, I, I would say you have quite the advantage on Saul today. We all do. So what's our excuse <laughs> for not putting off the old man and putting on the new? Say, oh, Saul was such a bad guy. Look how mean he was to David. But yet, Paul in the New Testament is telling us to put off all wrath and anger and malice. Put off all those same things. And we have the advantage today of not having an evil spirit vexing us from the Lord, but rather the complete opposite of actually having the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit to guide us and to lead us into all truth and to empower us. <clears throat> so be careful before you're just going to kick Saul while he's down. Not saying what he did was right. Obviously it's wrong. But what would we have done in his situation? What, would we have been any better? <clears throat> You say, okay, well, you know, how do you go back to Galatians chapter 5 or go to Galatians 5? Say, so in order to put off the old man and put on the new, how do you do that? You just will it? No, the will is, will, will fade. The will gets weak, it gets worn out. The solution is this is to walk in the Spirit. This I say, then he says in verse 16, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's part of that change in behavior. Walking in the Spirit and action. So what actions are going to be indicative of you walking in the Spirit? Reading your Bible, praying. This is how you walk in the Spirit. This is the practical application of the sermon. Are you praying? Are you reading your Bible? Are you going to church? Are you hearing the preaching? You know, that's walking in the Spirit. And you can't tell me you're walking in the Spirit if you're not doing these things, these basics in the Christian life. And you know what? If you're not walking the Spirit, if you're not doing these things, you're not putting off the old man. And it's only a matter of time until you're going to look in the mirror one day and go, oh, I recognize him. That's the old man. Up to do, doing the things he used to do. It's called being backslidden. 
<clears throat> so that's how you do it. That's how you walk in the Spirit. That's how you put off the old man. That's how you, you know, try to get on the right side of that conflict between these two natures. The very, these very practical things. Reading your Bible, going to church. Well, that doesn't sound like very fun. Very much fun. Well, you know what? Pleasures of sin, there's pleasures in sin for a season, but it's, <laughs> when sin hath conceived, it bringeth forth death. Is that really what you want for your life? You know, and, the, and, and you know, the Christian life's like this. It's going to have its highs and lows. It's not just going to be one giant, you know, roller coaster. Just hands up, woo, the whole way. You know, sometimes it's just standing in line waiting to get on the ride <laughs> for an hour in the heat, you know. That's not the exciting part of the, of the of, no one goes to the amusement park and says, I can't wait to just stand there and go through those stupid metal things, you know, go this way and turn around and go back this way and snake my way all the way up there. That's, is that the ride you go, is that why you pay all that money to go there, take time out? No, you go there because you want to go chink, 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 chink and go over the edge and spin around and nearly pass out and maybe throw up, <laughs> right? We pay for that. Sounds crazy. But it's a good time. And people get saved and get in the Christian life and they think that's what it's just going to be like the whole time. But you know what? A lot of the Christian life is just, well, I just got to, you know, the, right, the exciting part's up there, but today I just got to kind of go through the paces. Go through the paces. And you know what? And you'll get to go for a ride again. And then you'll get off and you go through the paces and then you get to go for a ride again. No one goes to the amusement park and rides one roller coaster and says, well, that was fun. Let's go home. You go there and you ride as many as you can. And you know what? I want to ride as many roller coasters in the Christian life as I can. I want to have as many thrilling experiences. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm at church yesterday and I'm looking at the map of the Navajo Reservation sighing going, when do I get to go back to the Navajo Reservation? Because it's, you know, all shut down because of COVID and everything. <clears throat> In the meantime, you know, it's that part of, of my Christian life is kind of put on hold. But you know what? There's still a lot of other things to do. And maybe I just need to go through the paces of just everything else I got to do. And we'll get back to that excitement. You know, I'm just making an application, you know. Right. But you need to stay in that, go, stay in the line, stay in line in the Christian life. Don't just get bored and say, well, that line looks shorter over there. Yeah, but it's not as much fun. Boy, the line at Faithful Word, man, it takes forever. Yeah, but we have the best roller coaster. <laughs> it's big and it's fast and, it, and it's tall and it's, you know, or you can go over there and ride the kitty coaster, you know. Do you want to go to like, you know, Six Flags, Baptist Church? The lines are longer. Maybe it's not always as exciting. Maybe the down times are a little more down than the, the real exciting times. Or you know what? You could go over and go to the local fair. And, and the lines are shorty, shorter, you know, but you've got to give your ticket to some carny or something. I don't know. <laughs> and the rides don't do this. Right? They just, they're, we're a lot quicker. It's not as, you know, it's, you might be able to get on there quicker, but the rides are over faster. It's, it's a... It, you see what I'm trying to say? Those other churches, you know, maybe, maybe they're not going to put you through the paces as much. But the rides aren't as good either. Hopefully this is making sense. Yeah. <laughs> this analogy. <laughs> I'll move on. The other thing we know, so we see here that, you know, Saul has that conflicted nature. And I'm reading, I can't help but think about the fact that we're, in the, we're kind of in the same way. You know, and we have to make sure that we're, which nature are you feeding? But also notice that, you know, Saul has no peace. I mean, would you say Saul is a guy that you want to emulate, that, that he's moving through life just at, at peace? And don't we want to have peace in our life? Of course we do. No one, no one wakes up and says, boy, I hope today is just, you know, full of anxiety and tumultuous and just I, I want to com be completely uncertain of everything that's ever going to happen. No one says that. But Saul has no peace here. And you know what? And there's no peace to people that are in the wrong position. When you are in a position that you do not belong in, there's no peace. And, I, and I'm just kind of bringing this up there because you can't help but read about Saul and, and not notice this. Saul is being vexed by the Lord 
Saul has just become a complete madman. And why is it? Because he's op occupying an office that is not rightfully his. God told him. And we already talked about this. God said, look, I'm done with you. I've sought another man. You're not going to rule over Israel. Somebody else is, you know, a, 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 someone who is better than you. A man after my own heart. A guy who meets the qualifications. A guy who's approved of God is going to fill that office. You're an imposter. That's what Saul is at this point in his life. He started out right. I mean, he had, at least you could say of Saul that he had the qualifications when he started out, that God, he was approved of God when he started out. But once he's disqualified, once God said, nope, done. And he tries to stay in that position and hang on to it. Look what he's resorting to. Murder, conspiracy, and as a result, he has no peace at all. You know, people that try, try to fill a role that's not theirs to take shouldn't expect peace from God. And I can't help about think about all these, you know, these guys that are self-ordained. People that just, you know, just step into a leadership position and, and oversee a church. And it's out there. <clears throat> and I've seen it more than once. They just say, well, I'm the pastor now, or I'm, you know, or, or uh, you know, I was sent here to lead this, this church. And then you find out, no, you weren't. The guy, the guy who says he sent you is like, mm, I never did that. Don't know what he's talking about. And, and, and you, know, you know what's legitimate? Because when, when, you, when those people get called out, they get real sensitive about it. Look, do you, do you think if some bozo on the internet, or some, anybody for that matter, anybody, not just some bozo, got up and said, Deacon Corbin Russell is not qualified. Do you think I'm going to lose any sleep over that? I bet you there's videos out there like that. I'm not going to go looking for him. But I bet you, do you think, do you think that would bother me? No, but you, know, you, know why, you know why it wouldn't? Because I'm not insecure about how I came to be in this position. Because I know that I went about it, that I, it came, one, it came to me, and two, I was deemed worthy of it. So I'm not going to lose any sleep, but the guy who's in that position illegitimately, they can't stand it when somebody says that about them. Or even hints at it. You know what that's called? Conviction. That's called being convicted of your own conscience. Because in the back of your mind, you know, well, they're actually right. I don't belong in this position. I shouldn't be doing this. And everything else is just a show. Self-ordained people are sensitive to the threat of legitimate leadership. That's what's going on here with Saul. You can't help but see that. He knows David. I mean, it says he eyed David forward from that day forward. He's, he's got his eye on David. He's like, oh, this must be the guy. Now, obviously, they're, saying, they're singing songs about David. They, David's getting all the praise. And now he's conspiring. He's trying to move against David. Why? Because David is a threat to his power. A power that he shouldn't even have. That God has ordained that does not belong to him anymore. And as a result, what does he have? A complete lack of peace. It's keeping him up at night. Look at verse 8. He says, And there was war again, and David went out and fought with, him, fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled from them. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand, and David played with his hand. I mean, <laughs> who walks around their house with a weapon just all the time? Just in his hand, not, not near at hand. I mean, he's walking around with the javelin. I mean, I, I, we're in Arizona, whatever. We like, to, we like to carry, you know, preferably concealed, right? But you, and you know, and I, I carry, you know, you, but do you think it would be a little weird? Do you think my wife would be a little per, just perturbed if I just walked around with a gun in my hand at, house, at the house all the time? Just came home, took it out of the holster, shunk, and just said, I'm just going to walk around with the gun, honey. Just sit down to dinner, put the gun down, eat my dinner, pick the gun back up, go get the mail, just walk out the gun, <laughs> mail. Probably get the cops called at some point. Got to change the flat tire in the church van in the driveway. Well, put the gun down, get that on. Had to do that the other day. I didn't have the gun in my hand, though. That's what's going on here. That's what Saul's doing, just walking around with this deadly weapon in his hand. It's like, are you going to war? Nope. Well, what are you doing with the javelin? Well, I just need to have it nearby. 
No peace. No peace. To a guy who has this conflicted nature that's walking in the flesh, wrath, malice, envy, deceit. No peace at all. Illegitimate leadership. No peace. Just paranoia. You know, and, and, and just... Just walking around with a javelin in his hand. Written ready to just throw it at somebody. Forget about accidental discharge. I mean, he's, he's like looking to use it. But look at, look at David. I love this. I know I noticed this when we were reading through it tonight. I didn't notice it when I was preparing. But it says he had a... Look, Saul's got the, the javelin in his hand, right? So it makes mention of what's in Saul's hand. But look at David's hand. And David played with his hand. You got one guy's walking around with a weapon, all paranoid, no peace, and you got David over there just, what's the matter, Saul? Just playing a little tune, right? I don't know if he had a harp, maybe, I don't know. Right? But he's just playing with his hand, playing on his timbrel or whatever it was. His hand wasn't clutching to a weapon, looking to defend himself or take somebody out. He's over there just completely at peace, just filled with the Spirit, singing you know, songs and praise and hymns. Just right at ease. Even though his enemy, the guy who just a few verses earlier had threatened to kill him, is walking around with a javelin in his hand. Like, oh, what are you, again? Really? And he's, but he's just at peace. He's playing. Look, if you get in the Spirit, and, if, and you know, if you walk in the Spirit, that's what you have. Peace. Even if there's just this looming threat, you can be at peace. And why does David have such peace? Because he's content to let the Lord fight his battles. He's content to just say, well, I'm in God's hands. You know, God's going to fight for me. I'm just going to commit myself unto the Lord. Look at verse 10. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. And Saul sent also messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. I mean, he's just content to let God fight his battles for him. He didn't pull the javelin back out and go, oh, I got your javelin now, let's, let's throw down. And I already talked about the fact that, I mean, you have to think about, if David, what if David had just imposed his will? Especially after he killed Goliath, like we talked about. Don't you think the people would have been like, well, that's right, he should be king, not Saul. After all, I, mean, I'm, I'm, I believe, uh, humanly speaking, a lot of people would have gone along with it. That if David had just said, you know what, I'm going to be king anyway. Let's just get rid of Saul now. And took it into his own hands. I think, I think the people would have gone right along with it. I don't think God would have. And David knew that. And David was content to let the Lord fight his battles for him. And that's why he has peace. But let's move on here. It says in verse 11, And Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him. And to slay him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, uh, if, thou, uh, if thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So Michael let, Michal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michal took an image and laid it in a bed with, with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolter. So she's making the dummy, right? Like you've always, I don't know if you, whoever, has anyone ever actually done that? I remember, you know, where you're trying to fool your parents or something. You've actually done that? Man, you kids are wicked. I don't even want to know the context. No, I'm just kidding. Couldn't have been that bad. I think I might have tried it once as like a practical joke. In fact, I th think faintly I did. Like I made a little image in the bed and put some hair and like hid. And then jumped out or something. Maybe not. I maybe, maybe I saw that somewhere. But that's what's kind of going on here, you know. And she, and she says, uh, and Saul sent messengers, verse 14, to take David. And she said, he is sick. So they're looking in there. They see the image. He's like, well, get, get him up. We see his hair. We see he's laying in bed. Oh, he's sick. He can't get up. And, and so they saw sent messengers to see, again to see David, saying, bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. I mean, think about what he's saying here. Oh, he's sick? Well, you know what? He can't get out of bed. Just, just bring the whole bed. I'll kill him in the bed. If he's that sick, or just, just bring him in the bed, and I'll kill him. Or maybe he's calling her bluff. But it's, to me, it wouldn't surprise me if he's just, at this point, like you said, he's got an evil spirit. No peace. He's just that vindictive. He's just that hellbent. 
And, just, and remember, just a few verses earlier, I swear by the Lord, he shall not be slain. He shall not be killed. Now he's like, get the bed up here and I'll kill him. I mean, can you just see how Saul's just being torn apart? The guy's going completely insane. I, just, I believe him, he's, he's gone mad. <clears throat> and when the messengers came in, uh, were come in, behold, there was an image of the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. And Saul said to Michael, Why hast thou deceived me so, and sent away mine enemy that he has escaped? And Michael answered Saul, He said unto me, Let me go. Why should I kill thee? So she, she lies, basically, there, right? Because David didn't say that. She had to implore him to leave. Remember that? She says, you know, if you don't leave by, the, by, by tomorrow, you'll be dead. And she lets him down through the, the basket. He, David never threatened her. She's saying that to Saul. And why is she saying that? To save her own skin, probably. Because, I mean, no one knows how Saul, I mean, he's just chucking javelins, threatening to kill people in bed, threatening to kill, you know, Samuel. I mean, he's, he's, he's ready to just, who knows what he's going to do next? He's completely unstable. So she's kind of smoothing it out here, saying, well, you know, you know, he was going to kill me, so I had, to, I had to go along with it, right? And I don't think, she, and, and you say, well, that wasn't very nice of her, you know, she's making David look bad. It's not like Saul really has David in that high of esteem at this point anyway. <laughs> I mean, you're chucking javelins and ready to kill the guy while, he's, while you think he's sick in bed. There's no, no harm, no foul here, right? She's just trying to save her own skin. But, you know, this does bring up the point about loyalty again, too. And where do we see the loyalty in marriage again between spouses? But let me, you know, let me apply it this way in saying this, that spouses come before parents. Spouses come before parents. Okay? Go over to Matthew chapter 19. And I, we're almost done. I know it's a, it's a familiar passage, but we're going to go there again. To get this, because you need to drive this through, because this happens. This still happens. And if you live, and you, and you, you, know, and you, you pay attention, you might even see it. I've seen it happen. Where somebody gets married, and then, and then the, the, you know, the, the bride, you know, turns out that Prince Charming, you know, has a little bit of a temper or whatever. Or maybe he just puts, puts his foot down over something and actually stands up like a man and actually tries to rule his own house even. Like the Bible says he should. And she, oh, gets offended. And where does she do? She goes running back to daddy. She goes back, running back to mommy. That kind of thing happens. Or, or you know, daddy's giving her, like, giving her you're going to you know, let her get married and say, well, you know, if he ever mistreats you, you're welcome to come back here. It's wrong. It's wrong. And I'll never say that to my kids. I'll never say that to you girls. You pay attention to who you marry because you're stuck with them. There's no running back to daddy once you, once you pick one out. Don't worry, none of them are going to want to marry because of the dowry anyway, but <laughs> I'm kidding. You're going to be fighting them off with a stick, right? But the point I'm trying to make is this, is that, you know, speaking of loyalty, you're loyal to your spouse, not your parents. And parents should not have, not put this mentality in their kids. This should be a non-option. You know, I'm telling my daughters right now, it's not an option to come back to me when you get married. Once you get married, you're his problem. You work it out with him. That's the way it ought to be. I mean, is that not what Michael did? He said, oh, well, you upset my dad, so you're dead. You know, I'm going to let him kill you. No, but she loved him. You know, and if you love somebody, you're going to be loyal to that person. Spouses come before parents. Look at Matthew 19, verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? What a stupid question. For every cause? Like they're just, you could tell they're just looking for it. She burned the muffins, you know. Verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Look, when you get married, it's one flesh. You can't just decide, well, you know, I'm, I don't want to do this anymore. This, he wasn't or she wasn't, whatever, and just tear that apart and go back. It's like tearing, a, it'd be like ripping your own flesh, spiritually speaking. And he's saying there, look, a man shall leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. Not just, you know, well, we'll see how this goes and, you know. And you say, well, that's talking about the man. But, you know, it goes, does God really have to say, and neither shall, you know, and a woman shall leave her, her, her you know, does he have to, like, reiterate it the, from the other way for us to get the picture here? 
that would be redundant and the Bible would sound dumb, right? <laughs> the, it applies both ways. The daughter can't go get married and then say, well, you know, he actually expects me to be what this book says and I don't want to do that, so I'm going to go back, run it back to mommy and daddy. You know, and if she does that, you know what she should run into? Either one of them. You know what they should run into when they walk through that door and, and make that complaint? Is a dad that says, you get back there right now. You're not, <laughs> you can't come back here. Get. That's what they should hear. Not, oh, you poor little baby. Oh, you poor thing. They said what? Oh, they did that to you? Because think about it. Think how wicked that is. That parent is fostering divorce. Oh, you come back. You leave him. You just encourage them to get divorced. They had a hand in it. It's wicked. <clears throat> There's no running back to daddy when you get married. Mike calls a great picture of that. Not that you'd probably want to go run back to that daddy. <laughs> Saul wasn't any daddy you wanted anything to do with, but it does show that she's loyal to what? To her spouse and not her parents. I'm not saying we don't honor our father and mother, but look, when we get married, it should come down, you know, our spouse comes first. Period. Look at verse, uh, go back where you were in, in uh, 1 Samuel. We'll look at verse 18. We'll wrap it up here. So David fled and escaped and came to Sam Samuel and Ramah and told him all that, he, uh, that Saul had done to him. He and he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. And it was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is at Naoth and Ramah. And Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, Samuel standing again uh, as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. And he sent messengers again the third time, and he pro they prophesied also. So he's trying, to, you know, he's trying to send these messengers to do what? To get David, to bring him back. Probably the same guys he told to go grab him in the bed. He's saying, go get him, get him back here. Like, yes, sir. And they're going over there, and every time they go there, they end up just prophesying. They didn't go there and think, well, we'll just go prophesy. They couldn't help it. They went there and it was just like God made it happen. It just came upon them. And why is that? Because God was protecting David. You know, and David is, you know, early on, he said, why is all these bad things happening to David? Well, David's learning very early on to just trust God through all these situations. Just trust God. Just trust God to him for deli to deliver him. And then it says in verse 20, then went he also to Ram. I says, well, you know, sometimes, you know, don't send a boy to do a man's job, I guess, or whatever. You know, if you want something done right, do it yourself kind of mentality. These messengers can't get it done. He thinks the problem's with the messengers. No, dummy. The problem is with your motive. The problem is, is that you're trying to kill God's anointed. The problem is, is that you're trying to attack David, who, you know... God is protecting. You know, that's, that's the sad part about Saul. He's so insane, he can't even see the situation for what it is. I mean, the messengers are going there like, hey, we tried, to, we tried to get him, but when we got there, we just all started prophesying. Wouldn't that make you step back and go, whoa, what's going on here? When something supernatural like that just happened? Kind of like when they told the Jews, hey, he's, you know, the, the Roman soldiers go back and they said, hey, this angel showed up and rolled the stone away and the tomb was empty. Oh, wait a minute, maybe we're wrong. No, they give them large money and say, just keep it quiet. And, you know, if anyone says anything, we'll, we'll stick up for you. You know, people, when they're, when they're wrong, when they get out of sorts with the Lord, which is putting it lightly with the Jews, right? They're, 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 they can't see the forest for the trees. That's one of the worst things about Saul in this whole process. He's just, you're like, why can't you see what's going on? and, you know, correct the ship. But he just says, finally, he's like, oh, well, they just keep prophesying. I guess I just need to go down there myself. Verse 22, Then he went also to Ramah and came to a great well that is in Siku. And he asked and said, Where is Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, that they at Naoth and Ramah. He also went thither to Naoth and Ramah, and the Spirit of God was upon him also. So it doesn't matter who it is, even if Saul himself goes down there. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth and Ramah. Do you think that, now is that what Saul was setting out to do? I'm going to go prophesy and preach. Is that what is he, is that what is he, no. He was going there to try and kill David, but he can't even get close to him. 
Wouldn't you love to have that power? You know, some guy is just coming at you, and just as soon as he gets close to you, he just starts singing a hymn or something. <laughs> to, you know, I'm going to kill you. To God be the glory, great. <laughs> you know? It's like a, like a divine force field that anyone just comes into it. They just start, you know, singing hymns. As soon as they get close to David, they just start prophesying. Imagine being David. Man, that just sends chills up my spine to think being David and that, seeing that take place. Oh, here comes his messengers. They're still after me. And then they're just prophesying and then leaving. And then another batch comes and it happens again and again. And then, then you see Saul coming. And you think, oh, great. There's that guy that did jab at me. And he starts prophesying. And not only that, look at verse 24. And he stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all day and all that night. So Saul, he thinks, oh, I just got to take matters into my own hand. He gets there and he gets, he gets even worse than the other guys. Not only is he prophesying, he's just like take, stripping off his clothes. Do you think he meant to do that? Do you think he's just like, thought na mistook Naoth for a nudist colony? And he was the only one that was abiding by the, the, the rules of being nude? Look at all, you guys are in a nudist colony, I'm wearing clothes. Let me show you how it's done, right? Is that what's going on here? I'm thinking he's just like, it's like God just grabbed his limbs. He's just like, ah, ah. <laughs> he can't even help it. He's just taking everything off. And he's prophesying. And he's laying down on his face all day and all night. I mean, he's causing, you know, the enemy of, of God's man to just come and worship at his feet. Like God told us, uh, told the, 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 I can't remember which church it was in Revelation. Someone's going to know it. He said, you, you are, you're the seat where, synagogue, you're the, the seat where, uh, where Satan's seen is. Behold, I'll make the synagogue of, of Satan to come and worship at thy feet and to know that I love thee. I know it's, I'm very loosely quoting that. But if you know Revelation, you know what I'm talking about. How God was actually going to bring these Jews and make them to worship before their feet. I mean, it's a, it's a great picture of that here. I mean, it's the same thing. God's enemy, your enemy is coming to you and then, and then he's just worshiping at your feet. That's why, you know, that's the great thing about being right with God is you have perfect peace because you know that no harm is going to befall you except that which God allows. And if God allows it, there's a reason behind it. And that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are called according to his purposes. You know, and, and this is an important message because today so many people are getting so anxious and fraught and just biting their nails over what's going on in the world. And you, I just, you're just seeing people that you just never thought would go that route, just melting down and losing it and just freaking out over coronavirus. And I'm thinking, is God on the throne still? Aren't you saved? Aren't you a Christian? Don't you have the Holy Spirit? What are you so worried about? Like, I mean, it's a real thing, I get it, but that's nothing. I mean, we're sitting here saying, look, we're talking about the fact that one day we're going to go through the tribulation. And see, you know, people want to say, oh, we might be the generation that sees the rise of the Antichrist. And how great would that be? Corona's fire come, comes along. It's like, oh, oh, what are we going to do? And you just scratch your head going, what's the matter with you? Have you read this story? You know, and I don't... I, what about the forks, forced vaccinations? You know, if it, you know, and it's like, I have, have, you ever heard, I have not heard, even heard any talk of that except out of the people that are afraid of it. It's like, well, what if they all haul us off? You know what? Then they're just going to have to haul me off kicking and screaming. Then I'll do, you know, if they put a, a needle in my vein and put some formaldehyde, there's worse things. You know what I mean? Even if, and I don't think it's going to come to that, personally. But like, that's your worst fear? I'm not for it. I'm against it. You know, but I can't control what's going to happen. If they, if that's, if they will, they will be literally kicking and screaming. I will make a big stink out of it if it came to that. But it's not going to come to that. <laughs> so why am I going to sit around and worry about things that might not even happen? And worry about things that even if they did happen, God could just go, nope. Do you think that's what David was doing when he ran to Samuel? <laughs> He sees the prophet, you know, the messengers come prophesy, messengers come prophesy, messengers pro come prophesy. By the time Saul shows up, David's probably just like, check this out. <laughs> this is going to be cool. He's just seen God deliver him, deliver him, deliver him. I mean, he's slaying giants, he's killing a bear, he's killed a lion. 
He's dodging the javelin. Don't you think he knows at this point that God is on his side, that even if the king comes rolling down, that God could just make him take off all his clothes and just fall down naked and lay there all day and night? Which is exactly what happened. I could just see David nudging Samuel. Check this out. I mean, the last thing I want to close on is on this, is that fighting God's man is a losing battle. Fighting God's man is a losing battle. And not because the man, but because it's God's man. Amen. <laughs> you know, and, I, and unfortunately, you see this happen in people. Unfortunately. You know, people that, you know, they, they, they attack a man of God, they attack a church, they go after people, and then you just, you give it time and some, something horrible happens. You know, and you feel bad about it and you don't want to rejoice when your enemy falls. You know, but you, you, you see it coming. And I, I remember, I, 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 when, that, when we had our little tift here recently, I preached a, a sermon about it called The Valley of Acor, about how people will just lead their families right into the, just the work, you know, right into God's judgment with the decisions that they make. And people were doing it at that time. And you know what? I heard some news this week where somebody did that. And you can just see God's hand just coming down. And dealing with them. And you know, the unfortunate part is that sometimes it, it, it's indirect. It's through an even worse thing. Like, it's, something happens to one of your kids. You know, I would rather have something bad happen to me than happen to my children. I don't care what the physical torment or pain or anguish or whatever it is. I would rather have it happen to me than my children. You know, so if God's looking to punish me and really get at me, you know, having something bad happen to my kids would be worse than him doing it to me. And then you see things like this happen and then people are just, oh, you poor thing. Oh, praise God that, you know, everything turned out okay. It's like, no. <laughs> you know, God's the one that did that. Because why? Because you were too busy attacking and slandering and spreading lies and attacking God's man. You know, touching, I mean, David understood this. I mean, he's got Saul right where he wants him. Naked, prone. He could have, oh, you want to throw a javelin? Give me that. Just thrust him. He could have taken care of business right there, but did he? No, because he understood this. That you don't touch God's anointed. That you don't attack these people. And, you know, and that's not just us. That's not just you know, the, 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 the ordained minister. That goes for you, God's people. You know, you, you know, vengeance is mine. I will pray, saith the Lord. You know, if somebody's after you and attacking you, the best thing you could do is just leave it in God's hands. Just leave it in God's hands. If someone's seeking to do you harm as God's elect, why don't you just let, leave it in God's hands? Let God deal with them. Because he'll do exactly what needs to get done and deal with them. And God does it. And I've seen it. And it's, it's, it's frightening. And it's frightening to watch people start to go down that path and say, <laughs> like, and you just want to shake them. So you know, what's there to be afraid of? What's there to be so worried about today in the world? Why, why are people so, why are even Christians today fretting about things? Why are they so worried about, you know, what's going to happen in the world? We know God, you know, if, God, if, 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 if the world rises up, you know, and the Antichrist comes to see and all that. Look, it's only three and a half years from there, right? And we'll be all set. So three and a half years, it's a drop in the bucket. It'll be over like that. Look, we need to just be loyal. That's really the message here, isn't it? If you're just loyal, if you're just loyal to the people that God wants you to be loyal to, be loyal to your church, be loyal to, you know, your pastor, be loyal to your spouse, be loyal to your, you know, children. Be loyal to your parents until you get married, right? Still be loyal, but, you know, there's a, there's a pecking order there. Look, if we're just loyal and we put that loyalty into action, God's going to protect us. God's going to take care of us. And we don't have anything to worry about. I don't care how many big, mean, nasty Saul's come along. God can just turn them into, you know, jello pudding. <laughs> the snap of his fingers. He can just take care of all of it. So just leave it in God's hands and just stay loyal, stay faithful, and continue you know, serving the Lord. Walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh and just trust God for the outcome and, he'll, and, he'll, and He will see you through. Let's go ahead and pray.